Okay, Lenny, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I think I'm the only rat onk here, probably, so I get to be a bit provocative and talk about some interesting things that uh, I think are interesting that, that we're doing in San Diego. Um, Lenny said I had, I had like 40 minutes, is that right, or an hour? No, just, <laughs> just 20 minutes, but I'm gonna cover, <laughs> I'm gonna cover quite a bit, about, about 40 slides, so I'll talk fast, jump through some historical stuff, and then get to um, autism as a precursor of MRT and what I think will be a therapy in chemo brain. And I've treated adults this way, and I'll walk you through that. And so briefly, um, we, we used to really perseverate with left and right hemispheric dominance issues in patients that had prefrontal syndromes of any sort, one side being analytical, one side being creative. I'm going to flip that and tell you I think the real issue is front to back, and that the dorsolateral and orbital frontal cortices are the areas where we see this disturbance. We know this by the executive functions being off in patients, and we've, we can look at the planning, thinking, judging, you know, emotionalizing, speech, feeling areas being disrupted in patients who have a whole host of disorders, but we see it in chemo brain. And a lot of our patients that have uh, a, a good response to, to therapy and are cured will go on and be dys dyslexic or have trouble in school or be defiant or have ADHD and these kinds of things. Um, the executive function area really it will, be, it will be a focus, and in that region, it's an area that is called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. That's the alpha generating region of the anterior part of the brain that tells the rest of the brain what the pace of the brain should be. And this is a complicated slide in a way, but really what I want to show you is that DLPFC region takes information that goes back to the occipital cortex and the visual cortex where we see most of our, 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 our information comes from, and it transfers that data uh, visually up into the DLPSC, which, which processes that data and does and thinks and plans and judges it and then sends that information back down to the rest of the brain. And that's really how that circle of information works in a patient who's got a normal flow of, uh, of information. That DLPFC, again, is implicated then in the executive functions in patients, working memory, cognition, flexibility, and planning, and judgment, these sorts of things. So the EEG is not a new phenomenon. It's um, been used for a long time. In the 50s, really, there was labs set up throughout the country. It was the one way to look at the brain. Well, I can tell you when imaging sort of came out, everyone said, well, that was old science. Who cares what the frequencies are? I can see the brain. And I can look, take a picture, a snapshot. And you get information from a snapshot, but it's a snapshot. You can't see any temporal relationships like you get with EEG. So over time, you can look at dynamics differently when you have EEG readings over time versus just a picture. And so going back and looking at this, we, I met up with a group uh, out of UC Irvine, frankly, a doctor here, Dr. Jin, who now works in private practice and um, is a psychiatrist. And he stayed with the EGs when others kind of dropped it and was doing laboratory work where he was looking at frequency matches in various patients of, of executive function disorder. And you see here an EG being taken of a patient. And what, what it does is it takes a electrical st um, signal, electrode from each one of those regions of the brain, and it can, we can map a patient's behavior almost from what we see on the EGs. And EGs aren't by themselves diagnostic, but it's getting there. Um, you see left is, is your odd and right's even numbers. You have frontal, central, posterior, occipital regions. And just the cortice is being looked at, just the very top part of the brain where all the action is in, in, in the gray matter. And if you look at what you get out of this, you get frequencies. And frequencies are, are cycles per second. And a cycle per second tells you how many times that neuron beats or sends a signal to its neighbors. And if you look at the bottom of this, a delta wave is that heavy sleep wave, and theta is also a sleep wave that we're in ideally when we're sleeping. If we're in those waves when we're awake, there's trouble. <laughs> and a lot of us are, but, um, especially after lunch. But, <laughs> but, um, and we go in and out of some of these, and we can peak beam off and on and various, have various levels of, of, of consciousness and alertness. But think of theta and delta as being sleeping frequencies. When you go beyond 8 hertz to 12 hertz, you're in an alpha wave where you're awake and alert. Beyond that, you're in a beta range where you're having anxiety, and, and it's oversampling your environment, and the neuron's beating too many times per second. So you can correlate, and we do this all the time, someone's state of consciousness with their EEG. If it's zero, they're dead. That's how we define brain death. If they're two, three, four hertz, they're in deep sleep. Again, if they're in the high levels, they're having probably some form of anxiety. If you overlay the map of the EEGs with the map of the homunculi of the brain, and for example, look at FP1, which is that front frontal lead, you'll see a tension in this area. And if this leads off or not operating at an appropriate frequency, there's probably a problem with the tension. And if this leads off at FP2, 
there may be a judgment issue, and so forth. And so you can see this sort of uh, almost like a um, diagnostic tree or map of, of looking at EEGs and looking at function. That's looking down front to you know, left and right, looking down on, on the patient. And what we see, and what we've seen with, for years are these sort of seismographs, maps, which show you how many times each one of those neuron beats per second. This is the front part, the middle part, and back part of the brain. Each one of those blue lines is a second. You're seeing about 10 different beats per second in this case. From front to back, the patient has a very nice, coherent, uh, 10 hertz process going on. Eyes are closed, they're, wi they're wide awake. If they have a seizure for three or four seconds, they go to three and four hertz, they lose consciousness, they say, I don't know where I was, I lost tra track of time, or I was out. Then this patient with narcolepsy wakes back up. But this is a front to back uh, global seizure idea. And really this is how EEGs were used, to look at states of consciousness, brain death, or seizure. What this group in, called Newport Brain Research Lab here just locally has done is created a Gaussian curve display of this data and put it into a nice little blue hump graph here, which we can look at distribution across the mean. We can see zero on the left here, and two and three hertz area here. This is a 10 hertz band. This tells you a lot of things. In a normal patient, an ideal patient, you have not only uh, most of your neurons firing at the same frequency front to back, but the right frequency, the amplitude's appropriate, the distribution across the mean's tight, so the majority of neurons are firing and speaking the same language and talking at the same speed. And information is transferred by energy when it's the same wavelength. And there's loss of energy and loss of information if there's a dissimilar wavelength between neurons. So think of this as being an ideal situation. <clears throat> In autism, here's how it looks. So these kids have frontal processing disorders, and most of these frontal leads are nearly absent of energy. So most of the neurons are over here hanging out at two and three hertz and not even like participating. So of course the kid can't have a thinking, planning, judging uh, ability when he's got very little neuron density working at that frequency. You can see back here in the occipital cortex where they are working fine. So if you give these kids a video game, they're fine. They have no problem all day long watching TV or video games. That part's working fine. When they try and transfer it to their DLPFC and start doing something with it, there's nothing up here to do anything with. The neurons are essentially asleep. So, so again, you can see this sort, of, this sort of picture of a nice awake occipital cortex and a very slow or asleep frontal cortex and also a sensory cortex. These kids have auditory processing trouble too because they're operating at four hertz in their auditory cortex as well. So loud sounds are very intolerable and socialization is of course almost impossible. So in comes this idea of transcranial magnetic stimulation. And what is it? So when you have an electric current, you create a dipole magnetic field. ECT is the idea of just shocking someone with a heavy current, um, like the heart or like their brain, and causing a huge current to go through the, the, the neurons themselves. And that also does a, a control at delete on the brain and resets the, fr the frequency. And this is a much logarithmically a lower order of magnitude impulse that's given off by that current in a capacitor that will discharge that frequency as a magnetic field, not, not as a true current. So when you do it this like over time and repeat that same stimulus to a patient, you can place a neuron into the frequency I want. So I can take your BEG, I can look at your brain and say, your frontal cortex is at eight hertz, it should be at 10. I can give you 10 and beat those neurons at 10 and make them restore that previous frequency. Um, and that's the idea of this repetitive TMS the machine's a very simple thing. It plugs into a wall. The patient doesn't feel this. It's a, uh, a little tapping feeling on the scalp, but in general, it's very pain-free and has a very long history of FDA approval and being safe. The seizure rate's uh, that of the population at large, so no really known induction of seizure. So if you look at the ideal pattern in autism, how do you get there? Can we move those kids over? Well, if you look at this picture, it looks daunting. On the left, you've got a normal person who's got a very flowing, nice, happy frontal cortex and an occipital cortex also operating at 10 hertz. So imagine two wheels of a bike spinning at 10 hertz at the same speed, and the chain between them is nice and tight. Information is being transferred nice and fluidly. In the autistic kid, there are four hertz or three hertz in the front, and the back is at 10. And so that information cannot be really transferred. There's a, a, a four, four hertz wheel going and a 10 hertz wheel going, and the information exchange is poor, if not... Uh, impossible. 
So what we do is we take those kids and we find their resonance frequency in their brain in the areas where it is working in, in an ice alpha wave, and we take a harmonic from their heart, and we can then give them a number frequency back to the areas that don't have that frequency. So in this case, the frontal leads get a area that was absent of frequency. We'll treat those areas. You'll see at two months, new, these neurons start beating over and increasing their, their speed, and occasionally they'll quantumly leap and hit that, that, that resonance frequency. And then when they get there, they, they tend to stay there. If you look at it two months, I'm sorry, this, this is uh, two months, this was two years, that's a typo. At two years, that was uh, stable. And you can see front to back, this kid who was severely autistic now has a CAR score from 27 to 17, which means he doesn't even qualify for autism. And much more social interactions and uh, uh, a whole different, different story. So I got involved in this because my son has Asperger's and I found this group and started treating my son. And I, when I got there, they were doing a trial on 28 children, mostly boys, of course, double blind. There's a sham coil where if you, if you flip the coil, it gives a pulse but not a magnetic field. So you can actually do a double blind study. And they were seeing these 60% differences in car scores in two, three, two, three, four weeks in kids. And I had a hard time believing that, frankly. There was no SAEs and you could see the EEG improvements. And they, they showed this graph at Autism One in Chicago earlier this year, you can see with a cohort in the high 40s, so car scores, which are child autism scores, in the 40s are very severely autistic. After five or six weeks, you see a big change in delta in their, in their car score behavior. And the open label group, when they were treated, followed that same course. And so this is a nice sort of double blind proof of a principle, almost like you would draw this, like it's fake. <laughs> How would you get that sort of response? And then once these kids got the actual treatment, they followed the same line. And here they are down here at um, about 12 weeks with scores that are, you know, 50% less than the original, original scores. So here's my son's handwriting. <laughs> November of 2013, this is how he wrote. Severely disabled in a sense, had a hard time in school, had a, had a one-on-one aid, he was on three meds just to manage him. That was uh, before, and then in April, after therapy, he looks like this. And if I, yeah, crazy. And then now, this was his, most recent. So this has now been less than a year, and the PTOT folks are like, what is going on? You know, what are you possibly doing to this kid? And he's off his meds now. And, the, and I could tell you a more uh, uh, about that, maybe if there's more time, but other behavior, behavioral changes are just like dramatic. Sleeping a full, a full night, you know, um, has eye contact, all these things he didn't have before. So I got one of the machines and said, I'm putting one of these in my office. <laughs> I basically just bought one. And I put it in my reddish oncology clinic lab in our, in our closet. And I put a curtain up behind to, to block everything and said, I'm going to start treating people with, with uh, all kinds of trouble because the, the principle in the depression and migraine was proven FDA, but they had not done this in PTSD, really, or in autism at large, and then Alzheimer's and the rest of these things, and then chemo brain. So I took ladies with chemo brain and assessed them because I had adults in my clinic as well. And I took all these uh, 10 ladies with TAC, with breast cancer, chemo brain effects. We do a neurocognitive test on them. I do an EEG, and I verify they have a deficit. And then, you know, they typically have these sorts of things you read about. Focus difficulties, reading trouble, emotionalization troubles, and difficulty paying attention, those kinds of things. Here's an example of one of the patients. I have 10 of these patients. You can see, remember the, the previous one where you saw one single bump? You can see all this disruption in chemo brain. And this was across the board. If I showed you 10 pictures, they're all very similar. You see a lot of activity at two and three and four hertz, two and three and four hertz. So the majority of neurons, or half of them, are being put to rest or off into this pasture, not doing work, but creating a slow waved function in the executive areas. So that not enough density of neurons doing the work of the executive functions of thinking, planning, judging, et cetera. And so what do you do with these? There is a obvious hump where the patient used to be, where most of the neurons want to be. You also see out here there's 15, 16, 18 hertz bands, this is all anxiety bands. So those areas are, are taken in the environment and oversampling it too many times and getting, and it causes perseveration, OCD issues, um, you know, Dell off the door, is a door locked, is a door locked, <laughs> this kind of stuff. They have to read the same line over and over again. Your patients will tell you with chemo brain, I read three, three lines, I fall asleep, I have to read it over again. So you can see it on the EGs, this idea that they have an anxiety band and also a, a slow wave band. So what we do, this is back in January, as I started treating these patients, and we picked a harmonic in this region. And by, 30, by two weeks later, you start seeing this recruitment of neurons following the leader, like a cadence of a marching drum. Like, you know, and over time, 
And two months later, you see this area where you see again a predominant band forming. And then here at three months, you have almost that ideal band. And her phenotype goes from angry, depressed, not, not bathing, not doing her hair or wearing makeup to makeup, cologne, <laughs> new outfit, growing her hair in, different person. And you can look at it and see it in front of my eyes. And I, I would have been very skeptical. And so I was skeptical. <laughs> so I treated 10 ladies this way and had a very consistent response across the board with adult chemo brain patients. Um, so here, other ways to look at this, here again, looks close to an ideal situation, and she acts that way, is you can look at the amount of theta or excess activity in the brain in this manner as well. Instead of looking at little blue humps, we can take pictures of the EEG, and this red spot tells you this is an excessively highly active area that following therapy is gone. And you can also look at areas that are too slow in the frontal cortices, in this area, an anxiety band, and both those are gone too. So you can look at this different ways. But you can see it objectively on these EEGs. You can also see it in the NeuroCog scores, which will do a pre-score and a post-score. And you'll see these movement occur in the patients as well. So we did really ex extensive 30-minute online NeuroCog testing coupled with the EEG. And then we did it before and after. And it has a sort of uh, uh, randomness to avoid learning. So the idea would be in, in, in kids with brain tumors, you've got confounding variables. And I've got kids with brain tumors that I've done their EEGs on them, and I treat them, and we give them either just regular chemotherapy or craniospinal with without RT, and there's changes in their brain. You can see it. You, the, when the brain gets traumatized, it slows down. The first thing it does is go, like in concussion, says, I'm going to not beat 10 times a second, I'll beat 5 times a second. Well, 5 times a second is not enough. It's a sleeping frequency. And so the idea would be to take leukemics who've got who are going to get a long course of chemo and or uh, IT and or whole brain and or TBI and successfully get their baseline EEGs, look at them during their course of treatment and look at the first dose response curve. When do we start seeing EEG changes by dose? When is, it, when is RT having an, uh, an effect by dose? Is 12 gray really different than 18 gray? Is TBI going to be worse or better than, you know, just whole brain in terms of effect? And then, you know, in my, in my, in my, in my, crani in my craniospinal patients, I... I've treated kids before and after and watched their EEGs improve and their behavior improve. And I don't have enough evidence yet to put that out there, but the same principle applies that in, as, as in adults. So this would be, I think, a, a curious thing. I was with Lenny here um, a few months ago talking about protons being provocative. We're, we're on the same side of the fence that we think protons are, have a, a role, but not, not so big. And uh, it turned into a chemo brain discussion. And I said, well, this is what happens I'm treating chemo brain in my closet, in my life. In my <laughs> In my, in my clinic in San Diego, he said, you've got to be kidding me. So this is what we're doing. So I've now opened a big center in Del Mar, um, 10,000 feet. We have like, we're going to bring in six machines. I have a trial for autism, a phase three trial, with 200 to 300 kids with autism we're going to do. And the thought would be to add in a, a chemo trial with chemo brain in kids uh, or adults. But I think, of course, our, our emphasis would be kids. And I think the leukemic variety would be perfect because of their long history course, all the things they go through, and the fact they have a long natural history. And um, the, there's no you know, primary CNS disease in those kids, in most cases. So that's really about it. Um, I have a lot of folks that I've worked with on this, and I want to recognize those, those folks. And thanks for having me and getting through that in 20 minutes.